fake news does circulate and therefore in some way we, we need far more controls. It looks like Facebook is going to be doing something about them. Chapeau to Facebook, although Facebook have been guilty of quite a lot of things. For instance, last year, uh, propagating Russian propaganda um, for Trump and against, and against uh, Hillary. So Michael, you've just been appointed the director of the CSR Sustainability Doctorate Programme in Geneva Business School. Now you seem to be taking a step forward in life, but we seem to be witnessing a step back for human rights, democracy, and general respect across the globe. What do we see here about this? Sounds as though I've got a lot of work to do. I, I think actually uh, you're right in some ways uh, that it does seem to be that a lot of our institutions are, are really suffering right now. Um, but let's take the word democracy. D democracy is not just about elections. It's about freedom of the press. It's about the rule of law and it's respect for human rights. So it's not just elections. Um, obviously elections are important, but as Winston Churchill said, democracy is a very poor form of choosing a leader, but it's the best one we've got. And I think we need to hang on to that. The problem coming is that uh, people seem to be much more short term in their thinking uh, than longer term. Uh, that sounds like something that nobody would really say or really understand. What do you mean by that? But I take, take the kind of the Brexit uh, issue when people rejected listening to experts. So you much prefer um, a, f a fishmonger to actually do open heart surgery on you. That's what it means about rejecting experts. So I think one has to be really, really careful about that. I always thought that, um, that education was the key to unlock uh, democracy, human rights, and respect for, for each other. I, I, my faith has been a little bit shaken um, in, in, in recent times uh, because you know, some educated people have been committing quite awful acts, terrorist acts and so on. We just about heard of one today in, in, in Las Vegas where somebody presumably with some education coming from one of the countries with the highest education in the world, you know, gets an automatic machine gun and goes and, and kills innocent people. That's a total nonsense. So it needs a whole combination of things. It certainly means less lying by our politicians in public life. So one of the lies I'm guessing was this uh, 350 million pounds to the NHS. Well, this came from uh, Boris Johnson, who might end up being the leader of the British Conservative Party and the next prime minister. This actually came out of private eye. Boris Johnson used to work for that. I, <laughs> between you and me, oh, and you. Uh, perhaps he should have stayed there. <laughs> However, uh, the famous red bus that uh, Boris Johnson campaigned on uh, last year for the referendum election said that uh, we would get an additional 350 million a week uh, if we left the EU. <coughs> so there's the first claim. The actual sum that we act be given to the NHS as a result of leaving European Union, zero. The third point there. The sum that Boris Johnson claimed we should give EU in a divorce bill as a result of leaving. Zero. The actual sum, something like 36, 40 billion dollars, no, pounds, the sum that Britain may end up giving the EU as a result of leaving. How can a barefaced liar like that then be appointed foreign secretary and be influential and powerful? in our country. I think it's absolutely disgusting. Fake news like this has to be held up and ridiculed as we're doing today. Well, I suggest sending the debt collectors over to Boris's house. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been to his house actually, and I stood outside it. And the day after I stood outside it, um, just to go, it was kind of like going to Karl Marx's uh, tomb, you know, is, is 
that's where the rot started. And my wife said, what are, you, what are you doing in front of Boris Johnson? I said, I just wanted to see where he comes from, to see the environment, to see what shaped that sort of thinking. And the following day, we, we joined a friend of mine in, in a restaurant quite near Boris Johnson's house. And we couldn't get to it because the water main had flooded and the whole of Islington had got flooded. Nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, we were speaking about fake news. Now, fake news always appears on social media. But also, what has the role of social media been in this whole sending people backwards being an individual instead of being a carer? Huge influences, absolutely no, no doubt about it. And the data are still coming in on it is that uh, instant messages, um, little control of, of, of messages on all the, the, the news sites. I mean, we're talking WhatsApp, we're talking Instagram, we're talking LinkedIn, we're talking Twitter, we're on the rest of it. And we see what a mess the President of the United States makes of his 80 characters. They just announced that they're going to expand it to 140. Maybe it'll come to some sense in those 140. I doubt that anybody with a has an, an idea or says something has a half-life of about 20 minutes, ain't going to take us very far. But fake news does circulate, and therefore, in some way, we, we need far more controls. It looks like Facebook is going to be doing something about them. Chapeau to Facebook, although Facebook have been guilty of quite a lot of things. For instance, last year, uh, propagating Russian propaganda um, for Trump and against and against uh, Hillary, uh, quite quite powerful use. So, the the social media is incredibly powerful. Let's hope it's not going to be used in in dangerous ways, and that responsible people can start taking control of it with respect. It needs education. It needs respect for experts. It needs thinking about what you're saying and do you really mean it? So has big company greed contributed to this step back? Probably some elements are, of it. There's always, there's always been greed around in, in human societies. But the, the, the question is, is kind of too simple for a very complex set of processes that are going on. Um, as I work in the field of corporate social responsibility, people say to me, ah, is CSR waning? One of the leaders thinkers in CSR said about 15 years ago, is CSR dead? Well, I just had lunch with the head of CSR <laughs> at, a, uh, at, a, at an oil company, and uh, certainly it's not. Uh, you know, the labels change all the time. It might be called something different. The thing is that over the last 20, 25 years, companies, the big companies in the world, most of them understand what corporate social responsibility is all about, and most of them are doing something about it. But you know, one, uh, one uh, swallow does not a summer make. So you see that BP was considered a highly socially responsible uh, company, but then, uh, what was it? The, th the thing Gulf in of the Mexico. Gulf of Mexico, yeah. And then also the Brent Spa in the North Sea and so on, um, which, which they controlled. Um, but they're, they're more to, they have a long way to go. And this is why that I, I've come up with... Uh, a charter for, for companies on the, on the big issues of the day. I think every company n now needs to start thinking outside the walls of their, of their company at the wider society because wider society problems eventually affect very negatively their, their business. They have to know what's going on and they have to be involved in some way. So I want to ask every big business through a charter to tell us what to them are the key issues, and what do they think they can do about it. Well, thank you, Michael, for joining us in the studio. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, speaking with you. Thanks, Key. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, being cross-examined by a true expert. <laughs> and thank you at home for watching. Don't forget to click like and subscribe to Dukascopy TV for more interviews like this. I'm Kaz Cahill. Goodbye for now. <laughs>